Hey everyone, Michael Adams here with another episode of the Rugby League Digest. As you can probably see from the title of this episode, this is not the next chapter of the Super League War. Uh, that is in the can, as they say, and will be coming to you in three parts from next week. Uh, some really momentous Super League action on your way. But this week I wanted to uh, turn the spotlight away from us, away from the Super League War, uh, just to tell everyone about a great new podcast BRL Moments in Time. So you're going to hear an interview I did with one of the co-hosts of that show uh, and a friend of the RLD, Chris Leeson. I had a great chat with Chris about all things Brisbane Rugby League, and you can hear much more about the Brisbane Rugby League on his new podcast. So I think this is a long overdue project, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about the Brisbane Rugby League as we go along. So I don't really know too much about it. This is one of the, the reasons I really wanted to get Chris on and to, to give him a platform on the RLD this week, just because it's pretty easy, especially if you grew up in Sydney like I did, to just see the Sydney comp, which you know through several iterations became the NRL we know today. You see it as a stand-in for rugby league, but I'm sure anyone who listens to this show will know that that's far from the case. The NRL doesn't mean rugby league and the New South Wales rugby league in the past didn't mean rugby league. So if you're like me and you don't know much about the history of the BRL, this new podcast is a great chance to get an education and get to know better the the players and officials and the rest of the people who made up one of the most significant competitions in rugby league history. So you can download the first, as we're releasing this, the first couple of episodes are out now. So it's BRL Moments in Time. You can go to iTunes or Spotify, all the usual places uh, it's it's available. Uh, I urge you to please uh, download and subscribe uh, and get stuck into it as I'm planning to do. As I said, we'll be back with the continuation of the Super League War next week. Uh, Andy will be joining me for Chapter 28. Uh, and as I said, it's the three-parter that uh, I'm very excited to to be able to share with you all. So you can look forward to that from next week. Uh, for this week, um, please enjoy my chat with Chris Leeson. Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams, and I'm here with Chris Leeson, host of the brand new uh, BRL History Podcast, BRL Moments in Time. Uh, Chris, welcome to the show and welcome to the Rugby League History Podcasting Fraternity. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Michael. Thank you. Pleasure to be a part of the, part of the community. Uh, the, the pleasure's all mine. Uh, I'm really excited about what you're doing. I, I think it's a, a much-needed corrective to the, the dominant rugby league narrative in Australia. So, uh I want to get into all of that, your reasons for starting the podcast, what the podcast is all about, uh, all the rest of it. To start off with, I, I wanted to get to know a bit more about you and, and for, for our listeners to do the same. So you're in Brisbane, I take it? Uh, yep, that's right. Well, I'm actually uh, living in Ipswich at the moment, which is just west of Brisbane, for those who might not be aware of the ge- geography in uh, southeast Queensland. But uh, yeah, I grew up in Brisbane, um, and uh, from the age of about oh, seven or eight, I was uh, watching footy on the on the TV with my dad, and uh, and we would go out to um, local grounds and uh, and watch BRL play. And there was a, a local junior club just down the road from us. Uh, we weren't allowed to play for um, for club because we had uh, school footy, um, so we only played at school until I was about sixteen. That's when uh, our family started playing for clubs. So all my younger brothers they benefited from me and my <laughs> and my brother who was about a year younger than me to uh, just nagging, nagging, and nagging and nagging. <laughs> so they were all able to play uh, from the age of about seven or eight um, at the at the local club. So. We, I, I just watched footy like all the time when I was a kid. Yeah, and uh, and Brisbane Rugby League was the uh, was the ruler at the time. We we watched the Sydney stuff as well, and you know had our um, Sydney teams that we followed. But uh, you know the Brisbane competition was good enough. We didn't need the Sydney competition to um, to get our kicks, so to speak. So I don't, I don't want to age you, but I am interested to know, you know, how far you go back with with watching the BRL and and you know Brisbane footy. Yeah, well, we I go back to uh, we we're starting our 
uh, podcast from 1968, and that's pretty much where I go back to. So um, we have decided to put 10 years together. We're going to go through uh, from 1908 all the way through to 1987, which is when the just before the Broncos came in. Uh, and that's a neat package of 80 years. So we're going to do eight um, seasons, and uh, each season will comprise a decade. Um, so we're going to start with the 68 through to 77 because a lot of people um, who played in that era are still with us. Um, some of them have gone, of course, but uh, a lot of them are still with us, and we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to pick up a lot of them and their families and friends to um, you know, give them a bit of a kick and talk about... Uh, why they made our lives um, such a, a joy when we were growing up. So, uh, so can you tell me a bit about your club, the the team you were following, and, and some of your favourite players growing up? Um, sure, I can. So when I um, when I first started, I uh, the f- first um, I suppose sixty eight, I was watching footy a little bit, but not a lot. But when I really got into it was sixty nine during the semi final series, and. Um, Valleys were playing against Norths and Valleys were the underdogs. So um, I supported Valleys. I went for the underdogs and uh, it was a pretty good time to jump on board because they lost that 69 grand final but then won quite a stack of them through 70, 71, 72, 73, 74. <laughs> so yeah, we had a good year in the 70s, yeah. What was, who were some of the players with Valleys at that time? Okay, so um, I guess when, when I first started watching, uh, the, the guy that really stood out for me was, uh, was Mick Retchelis. He was the Valley's captain at the time. He was a centre. And he, like, from my perspective, and I was only a kid, so I didn't really know anything, but I just thought he was fantastic. And I couldn't understand why he wasn't always the first guy picked for Australia, <laughs> let alone picked for Queensland yeah. or whatever. So, um, he, he was probably the guy that, that I thought was, um, was really, uh, terrific. Um, and uh, and then as the years went by, like he retired fairly soon after I started watching. I think seventy one was his last year. But then Marty Scanlon came in, and he was um, he was just as good uh, as a five eighth. And and I honestly couldn't understand why he didn't play for Queensland more often. Um, I, I I really don't understand that. It's just it, it yeah it defies belief. Um, but anyway, that's the way um, selections go. Yeah. It doesn't always go the way that you think they should go. Um, but yeah, they're the, probably the two guys that really stood out, but you know, I could name the whole Valley's team that they, they were so good in those days. Um, but it's also, there's so many other players in Brisbane who were, who were really good and it was just great to watch those guys play. Um, I I remember, um, so we lived in East's territory, not in Valley's territory and, uh, I remember going to quite a lot of games at Langlands Park, which was East's home ground. So I saw a lot of East guys play, and um, Des Morris was uh, he was similar to Marty Scanlon and Mick Rushless. You, you just wonder why he wasn't the first guy picked to play for Australia, and he never did play for Australia, which um, you know again defies belief. But uh, that's <laughs> the way life goes sometimes. And John Lang was at East, wasn't he? Or did it take him a bit later? He was no John Lang was was at East pretty much at the same time, yeah. and uh, it's a, it was one of the things when you watched East and Valleys play. Um, watching the hookers go around was um, was just an absolute joy because Johnny Lang was fantastic. He would tackle everything that moved, and um, he had a really good sniping game from dummy half, and he had you know great service. And um, then Hugh O'Doherty playing for Valleys was exactly the same. Mm. Johnny Lang would win a few more scrums, and in those days, winning scrums mattered. Uh, it, it was the only stat kept. Yeah, well, that's right. So he was the guy who, um, you know, uh, made all of the rep teams. But O'Doherty was quite often on the bench. And when you're picking a small guy who plays hooker on the bench as a, as a forward reserve, it you know it says something about the type of player that he is. So, yeah, it was great watching those two guys playing against each other. You mentioned rep footy. This was the era where you know that imbalance between New South Wales and Queensland was really starting to show. Uh, you know, obviously leading to state of origin in 1980. How was the imbalance in terms of the competitions? Do you think in the 70s the BRL was still you know holding its own compared to the New South Wales? competition well um I, I don't know like you can't yeah the brl was as a standalone competition they so say that's um yeah that's a given because it was so popular up here um 
that uh, it was definitely a competition that was worth watching and, and worth being a part of and, and worth supporting. Uh, as far as um, the quality of, of Brisbane teams and Sydney teams, I, I guess some of my research that I've been doing in this, you know, the decade that we're doing now, and uh, that's pretty much when the AMCO Cup started up. And uh, in the very early years of the AMCO Cup, the Brisbane teams were actually represented themselves rather than having a combined Brisbane team. And, um, you know, a couple of those Brisbane teams made it through to quarterfinals uh, in a couple of those years. So, you know, there was, there was some quality there. Uh, it, it was the way I put it down in, in my years looking back over it was uh, that the intensity of New South Wales was higher. And because the intensity was higher, that's what pretty much what happened to Queensland against New South Wales. That there was just that intensity that lasted for eighty minutes, not seventy minutes. And uh, you know, Queensland had hold their own pretty much all the way through. And then the last ten minutes, they New South Wales would score three tries and win a game. Mm. Um, so you know, those kind of things happen. And I guess the other thing with rep footy too is that there was, um, uh, th- from my perspective, there was a feeling that New South Wales players were better. And so even on those years when Queensland lost one year, and I can't remember the year off the top of my head, but there was one year where New South Wales won the first game after Queensland had had a guy sent off. And then the next game was drawn. And then the third game was drawn. And then when they picked a test team, there wasn't a Queenslander in it. There was two guys on the bench. So, you know, (laughs) when you kind of look at it like that, you think, well, surely there's four or five guys there who could have made that team. Yeah. Uh, But that's the way that it goes. You know, you just there was a set mindset and uh, the mindset, you know, prevailed. It, it's hard for me to, to really get a sense of, of what it was like. You know, I'm, I'm a bit too young to, to you know, I, I remember when there were players in Origin who didn't play every week and I got to see them three times a year. I just remember that. But, um, but yeah, it was kind of later, you know, seeing these weird names like, you know, Wynnum Mally, Wynnum, Manly and Valleys and all these names of, of other teams. And then you're seeing they had a Rothmans medal and they had their own footy publications and all the rest of it. Um, growing up, were the, were the Brisbane players, were they like the football celebrities to you? Like what um, what did you know about the Sydney players? Um, well, growing up, I got uh, Rugby League Week all the time. So we knew about the Sydney players because there was... Um, not media saturation like we get now, but there was certainly media media saturation for that time. So, you know, we knew who those guys were, particularly the the better players, we knew who they were. And a lot of those better players were were guys who had played in Queensland and and gone down um, to New South Wales as well. So we kind of followed them and, you know, kept kept abreast of what was going on in that respect as well. Um, But, yeah, to answer the first part of that question, as far as um, being guys, PRL players being the um, the rock stars of of the the day, yeah, they were. They definitely were. It was, um, yeah, it was amazing to be able to walk down the street and and see somebody who uh, you'd seen playing on the field just uh, just the, the weekend before, and you know, wow, wow, look, there's Des Morris walking down the street. <laughs> so yeah, it was pretty cool. That's for sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, some of the the all time greats were playing in that competition in the eighties. Um, you know, it's something I'm particularly interested in. When it seems like you see all these names, you know, Lewis and Miles Meninga, it, it seems like it, it, it would have been like a, a really strong competition. But it seems like this is where teams were going bankrupt, and um, you know, the divide between New South Wales and Queensland was becoming really wide, leading to the, to the Broncos. So. Um, did did you get a sense of something changing, you know, into the eighties? Um, yeah, look, it, it was it was happening all the way through the seventies because there was always talk of um of play, of teams sorry running out of money or clubs running out of money or being in um you know dire straits uh, as far as finances were concerned. So that was something that was um just continually mentioned it, it was always in the back of your minds uh and as a valley supporter valleys were one of those clubs that that struggled and it could have been because they were so good they had so many good players to pay that um you know that's that's why i kept running towards the wall and um and the fact that we didn't have those poker machines and big clubhouses to um to back up the clubs made it a whole lot more difficult so 
you know, we're talking about a competition that was run on chook raffles and doubles, really. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's pretty much the extent of it. Um, so uh, I suppose to keep running the way that they did was was pretty pretty good going in in the sense. But, um, yeah, I... I got that sense all the time that there was that there was trouble brewing as far as money was concerned. Even when I was a kid, um, you, you worried about what was going on every time you, you read those kind of things in the paper. Yeah. I, I realise now I'm, I'm kind of harping on, you know, the end and, and the bad times, I, I guess, because that's where my headspace is in terms of uh, all my research. So I, I do want to get back to, to what the, the podcast is doing and, and, you know, the celebration of Brisbane footy. But but just to stay on this note just a bit longer, um, I, I know you're you're quite uh, anti the Broncos, um, and I'm interested <laughs> to get a sense of of where that comes from and and what you were thinking in in 1987 when all that was going on. Well, it wasn't so much 1987, Michael. Uh, so that's uh, that's part of it, I guess, because it didn't take long once the Broncos came in before Valleys uh, folded. But you know, Valleys were on that way anyway. They had that short-lived amalgamation with um, the Tweed Heads, Seagulls, and um, and then they had another short-lived uh, amalgamation with Caboolture, and uh, it just, you know, neither of them really worked. Both of them were thinking along the right lines. They had to get out of that landlocked uh, area that they were in the inner city to uh, be able to attract some juniors and some extra people from, you know, from outside, uh, but... Uh, they just didn't have the time to do it, and um, and it ended up folding as a senior club. I mean, their, their junior club still runs now, and uh, doing a great job at, at the moment. I'm actually the uh, the secretary this All year right. at, at Valley's Juniors, uh, which has been an eye opening experience. But watching the way that the people at that club work, they're you know they're really amazing people, and I know that they're not the only club that that does that kind of amazing stuff. There's junior clubs all over the country who are. Um, doing that kind of work without a whole lot of help or recognition. So uh, that's what keeps the game going. It's not the NRL, that's for sure, uh, because the NRL wouldn't happen without those kids playing the game in, in those junior clubs to be able to play at a NRL level later on. No, totally. I'm, I'm actually, uh, my, my son has just started in, in under sixes at Renown here in Sydney. And so I'm, I'm getting a, a sense of that all for the first time. And it you really do feel that you know that you're part of the lifeblood of the game when you're involved in in a local club and junior footy. You do. It's certainly uh, something that's given me a, a real kick this year. And uh, just talking, uh, <laughs> hearing you say that that your son started at Renown, it brings me back to the Broncos question. So the main reason that I'm a bit anti Broncos is because I actually support St George. All oh, right. And so ninety two, ninety three didn't uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> didn't endear me to the Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did that? When did your St George fandom start? Uh, pretty much the same time as Valleys. So there was a, a semi final, and uh, you know St George were underdogs. Souths were expected to win, and and Souths did. And <laughs> so, so, so you you just missed one golden era with the Dragons, but you you made up for it with with Valleys. That's correct. Exactly. I missed one, and uh, but I picked up another. Yeah. <laughs> um. I, I. You know. I think we've had had a few conversations online and that sort of thing, but I, I really became aware of you. Uh, when you were a guest on uh, our friend Dave Hunter's Hypothetic RL episode, which um, just an aside, that that was the moment listening to that where I was, that show went from just a kind of fun distraction to something that could be quite important. Um, uh, anyone who hasn't listened to that episode, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link out uh, when this episode goes live, but um, a fantastic chat you had with Dave looking at an alternate history of you know what might have happened if if the pokies came in to Queensland and you know the the Broncos didn't enter in eighty eight and things broke down a different way. Um, it seems that the you know the way you ended up was basically that whatever alternate reality you could dream up leads you to eventually some kind of national comp or some kind of merging of of Brisbane and Sydney. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any opinions on what do you think the best breakdown of if you know if the two competitions were merging on on equal strength you know like would would you pick you know four Brisbane teams six Sydney or or what what would be your ideal split? 
Oh, that's a hard question off the top of my head. <laughs> um, I, I think you're probably going to go with um, four Brisbane teams, and it probably just would have uh, it probably just would have happened. Um, so Valleys uh, folded, you know, in the in the nineties, and and Brothers pretty much around the same time. So there's there's two that are that are gone out of those six already. Um, Ipswich were looking to come in. Uh, Gold Coast were in. They were part of the um, state league as well as Ipswich. Redcliffe's not really in Brisbane. It's outside of Brisbane. So you could start looking at all of those satellite clubs as being you know particular satellite clubs and not uh, and not particularly Brisbane clubs. And then similarly in um, in Sydney where you look at. Uh, at Parramatta, Illawarra, Canberra, Newcastle, like you'd keep all of those that are and Penrith, all of those that are particularly outside Sydney satellite clubs, and then you know look at what do you do with the rest of them? Do you move them somewhere else to get this national competition happening? Uh, that's probably as far as being ideal is concerned. That's that's the way I would go. And even if it meant that you know St George would have been somewhere else, like you know um, Townsville would have been St so Townsville Dragons instead of mm-hmm. St George Dragons or something like that. That's that's the way uh, I always looked at it when I was, uh, you know, I suppose in my early 20s, I used to think, why don't they just do that? Like, just move them somewhere. I know that's going to be painful, but it's better than dying. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So that's the way I always thought that it, it should have worked. And, and I expected that they would have teams across the, the country. Like, I expected that there'd be a team in Perth. I expected that there'd be a team in, in North Queensland and... Um, and I expected that there'd be one in Melbourne and probably Adelaide as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bit sad that here we are in 2021 talking about a second Brisbane team instead of, you know, what what we once had and and probably should have again. Um, but let let's get to the to the podcast itself. Um, can you just for for our listeners kind of set up, um, you know, what it's all about and and what we can expect. Um, I'll do my best. So basically what we're going to do is, is um, have a chat about um, the year that was. So the first episode is 1968. So we're going to have a chat about the year that was 1968. There'll be some things that are not football related. Um, and I'll give you a, a teaser, I guess, that uh, 68 was um, the Olympic Games in Mexico City. And um, Peter Norman from Australia came second in the um, in the 200 metres final. And that's the... Black Power salute um, thing, so we'll chat about that. It's not a lot, a lot, but that gets an airplay. And you know everything else that uh, that was big in '68, or that was big in Brisbane in '68, will get some kind of airplay. Um, but then we dive into what happened in the footy. Um, you know, we sort of talk about the the people who were um, who were playing the game. We talk about the clubs that played the game, um, and we talk about that actual competition and and how it transpired. Uh, and, um, yeah, hopefully it'll be interesting. Uh, I think it will be. I know that there's plenty of things that are in there that uh, are worth having a listen to. I think the um, the Barry Muir story is um, is a great one to hear, and that's we, we dive into that in 1968 because there are a couple of things in 68 that, um, that pinpoint Barry Muir as somebody to talk about. So, yeah, we do that uh, in 1968, and um, I think that's a pretty good episode. And then after that episode's finished, um, the next week we're going to dive back into 68 and just talk about the players. And um, we know that we're not um, not the be-all and end-all as far as, you know, people who know what's what about um, Brisbane Rugby League, but we're going to open up a, a BRL Moments in Time Hall of Fame. And basically the idea for to, to do that is to just look at, um, well, who stood out in that year? Um, and see whether or not over the course of the 10 years that there's, you know, a group of players who stood out so much that you'd say, well, those guys should be in the Hall of Fame. And, and let's recognise that, that Brisbane had some pretty pretty decent talent running around. Um, and I can say that in 68 and through the 70s, there were plenty of guys playing in Brisbane who never had an opportunity to play for Australia, and they probably should have because they were equally as good as, or in some cases better than the guys that... Uh, that from New South Wales who did play for Australia. So that's pretty much the way that we're going to go. And then we'll occasionally have um, interviews with, with players who played the game as well. So uh, we have an interview and we'll run them on our Hall of Fame um, episode. So we'll have our first episode about the year that was 
and then the next episode is a little bit shorter so we'll tack a an interview onto the end of that um each second every second week uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this it's it's a chance for us to to try to shift our our sydney focus i i, I always have to remind myself as as i go about my research and our podcast that sydney isn't the be all and end all of rugby league um it's hard when when you grow up with that mentality but um this podcast will for me be a a necessary corrective to that so uh, i'm I'm really looking forward to to what you've got in store i will say as uh in our first incarnation of the rugby league digest uh our own uh hall of fame um very difficult concept to to nail down the parameters of I think we had, you know, wild, oh, right. <laughs> wildly shifting goalposts on on what constituted a Hall of Famer and and all the rest of it. So it's uh it's murky territory you're wading into. Oh, it's definitely murky territory. We've already shifted goalposts in our um <laughs> in our conversations, but we think that we've nailed them uh to a particular spot at this point in time. Anyway, we're we're trying to uh to do it a certain way. Like most of our research, in fact. I'd say 95% of our research is newspaper based. So, uh, because when we go back to 1908 and, um, you know, even through the 30s and 40s, there aren't guys around who saw those blokes play. Um, so, we, we can't rely on them to give us a feel. We can rely on our own eyes and what we saw through the 70s and through the 80s to say, well, these guys should be there. But then you're changing the goalposts for those blokes that you didn't see. So, Everything that we do is is we think that we've got parameters that are sorted out for it, and we know that we're not an official thing. It's just a way to be able to recognise some of the guys who who played to celebrate that um, uh, that era, that um, competition that ran because it was a pretty good one, and there were pretty good players playing it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I kind of had this say for the end, but I, I think it's a good place to discuss it. When you talk about a Hall of Fame, I've, I've seen a lot of talk uh, online about the best way to, you know, recognize BRL records. Like there are some people who argue that, you know, 100 first grade games is 100 first grade games, you know, whether it's in Sydney or Brisbane and those records should be combined. There are some who say, well, no, we've got to do a better job of recognizing them, but they're separate competitions. So they should exist as separate records. I wonder if you've thought much about that and and what do you think the the best practice for that would be yeah I, i've thought about it a lot and um I, I honestly think the best practice is that you recognize all of them because if you're playing cricket it doesn't matter if you're playing cricket in south africa or in england or in in australia if you're playing a first class match it's a first class match mm. so in 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 australia during well for any time from 1908 up until 1987 um, there were two major rugby league competitions. So if you played an A grade game in one of those competitions, that's a first class match. You get right, you know, you get a an A grade game attached to your um, to your record, and and that's what I believe should happen. It, you know, it, I I can't understand that uh, that there isn't um, a belief or that there isn't a push to really make that happen because. You know, Wally Lewis and Mel Meninga, for example, you know, they get so many hundred games, whatever the hundred is. I think Mel's, Mel's got 200 and something games for Canberra. Mm. But what about all those games that he played for South? And it wasn't like he was playing nobody when he was playing for South. So I just can't, uh, I can't work it out. And and he'll be the first one to tell you that the footy was just as hard playing for Brisbane South as when he came down to Canberra. Oh, yeah, of course it was, because there were plenty of guys around who... Uh, wanted to win the game, just the same as there were plenty of guys around in Sydney who wanted to win the game. I mean, like I said earlier, that that I think it's that intensity thing that, that you know, just with that slight edge of intensity, uh, and that's probably because of you know you had better players there for for longer periods because you've had money there for longer than we've had money here, uh, and so you know there was just players would gravitate from the country into the into the city for the money and people would gravitate from the from Queensland down to the to Sydney for the money and it, and I'm not denying that it wasn't a better competition what I'm saying is that Brisbane was still a good competition mm. and it was you know there were players and clubs in Brisbane that would hold their own in Sydney like easily easily like that Valleys team of the 70s would easily hold its own in Sydney uh, competition it wouldn't be running last that's for sure yeah <music> 
imagine getting paid to do what you actually love doing? Tell us what those things are, and we'll tell you how you can do them in the Army. Go on, get paid for doing what you love. Search Do What You Love. This, I, I think you I, I kind of know what your answer is going to be based on what you're saying, but I, I'm interested to know in in what was the impetus for, for getting this going and, and, you know, starting this podcast? Oh, um, I, look, I've, uh, I've considered it for quite a while. Um, when I first came across podcasts, which is oh, ages ago, like years ago, and um, I considered doing it, but I never really had the time uh, to do it, and I don't have the time now, but I just thought, <laughs> uh, look, if it's, if it's going to be done... Uh, I don't think anyone else is going to do it, uh, and I, th- I just believe that it that it should be done. And um, I, I had a a real push towards it uh, towards the end of last year, and um, I, I took on the secretary job at Valleys uh, at the end of last year. And um, just having that reconnection with some of the old old boys at Valleys, and uh, it just meant it just pushed it even further that it, it's definitely something that has to happen. There are guys around who who played the game who people don't even know that they played the game and um, and you know they've got a story to tell and the story's worth worth hearing. Um, it's, I, I found out you know I, I didn't know it, but um, my cousin's husband played in the BRL. I didn't know that, and he was playing for Norths when Clive Churchill was up here coaching. So. Um, he's he's on the list to to interview, and I can't wait to do that interview. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to chat about stuff that I had no idea that he was involved in. So, it, it'll be great. There are stories that uh, really deserve to be told, and uh, I'm hoping that we can tell some of them. Yeah, I've um, you know, got in front of me now my copy of Steve Haddon's Our Game. Oh yeah, good book. So good. Uh, in addition to being like a brilliant reference book, just a beautiful thing to look at. It. Um, it's 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 one of my favorites but um just when i was go when i got that and was going through it i'm i'm seeing these names like you know the Belusky brothers that played in in you know like the teens and these kind of players that it, it seemed like there's a story there that we we've just never heard yep yeah, um there is a story there and i can't remember what year it is but that story gets told it's a it's a beauty it is it's a cracker <laughs> yeah, that story is a good one. It's definitely worth being told. So Mick Bielewski was uh, was one of the first kangaroos, um, and uh, and him and a couple of his brothers all um, played. Most of them, they, they mostly played in Bundaberg, but they all played for Queensland, and uh, and a couple of them played for Australia as well. So yeah, so th- that's a uh, pretty good a pretty good family there to to talk about. And there's another uh, family, the Hydkeys, who were also from Bundaberg. So. Uh, Wilhelm Heike was uh, was also a member of the first Kangaroos. Um, he was from Bundaberg too, and um, him and a couple of brothers also came down. And I'm pretty sure that Beluskis and Heidkies all played for Winner Manly when Winner Manly first came into the league in um, I think uh, 1917 or you know somewhere down there. I can't remember because my focus at the moment is <laughs> is from the 60s to the mm. 70s. But uh, yeah, I have done that that one, and uh, that story gets told. It's a goodie, yeah. And, and were these kind of names and, and other, you know, names that you'll see along the way, were these stories that were familiar to you or is this something that you're like really discovering as you go along with the research? No, it's all stuff that I'm discovering. And one of the beauties of it is uh, is when you see family names that crop up and you think, oh, holy cow, is that related? And you do a little bit of ancestry research and, uh, you know, you can sort of link uh, link families together from you know back in the the early days up to you know playing in you know, through the seventies and stuff. So there, there's some links like that 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 happen, and uh, it really sort of warms the heart to see that link of uh, of generations coming through the game. Yeah, there's some good stories that that go through the game like that. And um, I don't I don't know if this question is going to be interesting to anyone other than me but but i'm really interested in it so you know i mentioned our game which is like a a great source for me you mentioned that um you know a lot of your research comes from the newspapers i'm I'm just really interested to get a sense of your research process and and you know how much detail you go into and what sort of sources you're looking at 
Yeah, well, mostly I'm looking at uh, at newspaper sources. That's that's pretty much all of it. Um, there are a couple of uh, times where I get things um, that might come uh, from somewhere else, but uh, I haven't used our game for exam for example because uh, uh, Steve Haddon has a a disclaimer in there about um, not using his stuff um, unless there's uh, approval given. So I didn't even. Um, I asked him if we could, uh, you know, use it, and he said that there was a disclaimer in the front of the book. So I thought, okay, well, that's fine. I'll, I'll just leave mm. that out, and I'll just go with the research because the the whole point of what I'm trying to do is to um, look at what happened from day to day. And Steve's book doesn't really go through what happened from day to day anyway. So yeah. Um, yeah. his book is fantastic, and I absolutely love reading it. Um, and I've read it through a couple of times. So um, you know that's sort of good but um yeah our, our research is newspaper based and and um the, there's another steve up here in brisbane steve ricketts who's uh um be, was a newspaper man he played in the brl for a little while as well and uh he's a, a rugby league historian up here in queensland and he's he's helped out a bit with that he's been able to help me out with some archives for newspapers and things like that so uh he's been a a real fountain of of um information for me which has been terrific but uh otherwise it's just you know head up to the up to the local um state library and get out your microfish and yeah. have a look through what's going on there or um you know with the old ones you can get online and and use it there so that's pretty much most of the uh research that i've done is is through that way um and then occasionally, particularly with the older ones, because I've I've already sort of outlined what we're doing from 1908 through to um, 1917, and uh, and we've I use ancestry a fair bit with that, just to find out you know where did some of these guys come from, what did they do, how did they you know what's their story, because you don't always find the story in the newspaper. Um, so that's the other part of it, but uh, certainly for all of the um, up to date things sort of say through the 60s and 70s and it's all newspaper based uh, because it gives you the day-to-day -day story and uh, you know some of those stories that you can um, follow through uh, you know you might get oh, eight to ten <laughs> articles a bit written about it over the course of a couple of weeks and you know so you can sort of tell that story as it as it unfolds it's funny i mean having gone through a similar um, you know research journey you really do get a sense of a season when you go through, you know, like, you know, it might be a, a season's worth of rugby league weeks or, or the newspaper articles in chronological order. It, it, you really do feel like you're reliving the season in real time. Do you, did you get a sense of that in your research? I did. Look, there's a couple of times, like there's um, one time in particular, and I'm, I'm not going to give away the story, but it's a goodie. Um, I was at Langlands Park and... Um, and there was a particular incident that occurred and I remember it as crystal clear as from when I was a kid and you know I was going through all of this research through the 70s and it never pro cropped up and I thought I can't tell that story because I really don't know when it happened and uh, just last week I found it yeah <laughs> right it, it came up in in the newspaper and I've gone oh fantastic I can tell the story so um, you know there's things like that 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 occur and you're right you can you get that sense of of what's been transpiring and uh you know we we talk about the uh, uh the guys who win the rothmans medal and we talk about the guys who uh win the courier mail best and fairest awards for the year and you know you sort of you can see that unfolding as you go along um yeah it's it's a good i think it's a good ride to go on mike yeah mm. we're uh, we're enjoying it and, and so what's the plan once you get through the, the 68 to 77? Are you going back to the start at that point or are you pressing on to the 80s um, straight after that? Well, yeah, we. it may be that... Um... Yeah, it may be that public opinion will tell us what to do, what yeah. to do in that regard, but, but my um, initial plan is to go back to the beginning um, and then to sort of jump around a little bit and... and you know pull bits out here and there so i've done the first 10 years and i've uh i've done i can't remember if it's a i think it's the 40s and 50s um so w we've done a fair bit of research you know to get us ready to to be where we are but research doesn't mean that you've got a 
um, a podcast ready to go. It just means that you've you've got a background to be able to build it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, so you, you know, you mentioned we. It's not just you doing it. Can you tell me a bit about your co-host? Yeah, so the uh, the guy I've got going uh, got with me. He's um, he's younger than I am, so he doesn't go back as anywhere near as far as I go back. Because I, I quite often um, during this first se- first series have been asking him. So do you remember that, Dave? No, nah, Chris. <laughs> so, uh, um, so yeah, he's a bit younger than me, but um, he has a passion for for the BRL. And he, uh, I was having a chat to him just this afternoon. We were recording an episode and. Uh, he was saying, I, I said to him, Dave, I don't know even who you followed. Like, you've never brought that up. And he said that he didn't really follow anybody. He just used to, you know, he used to like Wally Lewis. So he, he went for Valleys and then Wally went to Winner Manly. So he went for Winner Manly and he used to like watching Des Morris play. So he went for East. Like, so he just, uh, yeah, went for whoever the players were. He liked Mel Meninga playing. So he went for Souths while Mel was playing. So. Yeah, he just used to follow the clubs and follow the game. He he just liked the loved the game as well. Um, and the, Dave's got a particular knack of um, of uh, being able to um, speak in a different way. So he's um, he's really good to bounce off. We've we've sort of started to gel as far as the way that we present things. But um, he's a, a teacher where my daughter goes to school. And last year when um, you know we had all the homeschooling stuff. Uh, I saw a completely different side of Dave. We've had a couple of conversations about the BRL and, you know, about music and things like that. So we we clicked already. But uh, watching him do some of those uh, teaching, uh, remote teaching things for it, he was hilarious and he had all these different voices and different routines and stuff. So we don't necessarily get the hilarious Dave, but um, when we're quoting from the newspaper, Dave Dave does the newspaper voices. So he's, he'll... um, (laughs) You know he'll be the quotes. Uh, so it, it's it's not exactly seamless yet, but we today we did a whole lot better than we've done in the <laughs> previous <Yeah>. couple. So <laughs> yeah. And and have you any had any contact with um, some of the the BRL clubs that are still in existence today? Uh, I have, yeah. So um, the guy who's uh, who does the history stuff at uh, Winner Manly's been um, pretty helpful, uh, and. Uh, I have contacted, um, I've pretty much contacted most of the other clubs, and there's a couple of other clubs who um, have said, "Yeah, well, we've got so and so to contact. You know, let us know when you want to know something, and they'll be able to help you out." So, at the moment, I'm um, I'm just going full steam ahead to try to get um, try to get this first season uh, in the can, so that I can then have time to be able to go back and contact clubs with a little bit of breathing space and find out what they can offer so yeah i've got uh four i think of the of the eight clubs at the time um have all been able to help out with that um so that's been good uh i'd I'd just like to say good luck in the in the breathing space i've been chasing (laughs) breathing space for about three years and and i've I've nowhere near found it yet so (laughs) I, i wish you well on that yeah, I can appreciate that, and certainly, Michael. That uh, I, I don't think I'm doing anywhere near what you guys do. So, <laughs> yeah, I, and I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, maybe you've answered this in in your allegiance and and the the era uh, of glory in the early seventies. But are there any particular seasons or particular eras that you're really looking forward to to diving into? Um. You know, there's there's certain parts um, that I really look forward to diving into. So um, I loved doing uh, 1908 through to 1917. That was probably the most fun I've ever had as far as just reading stuff. And um, I, I was just just completely got lost in it. So that was, that was good. I really enjoyed doing that. Um, but uh, we, we've just recently... Um, finished doing a couple of uh a couple of episodes and um yeah there's a couple there that uh that come up pretty early in the piece that um that I really enjoyed doing i think that the uh 1970 season is um is fantastic that the finish of 1970 you, you couldn't um you couldn't write a better script it was it was fantastic uh, so i'm not going to give it away uh but yeah. yeah there was stuff that happened towards the end of the season before um, grand final time and it was an extra time grand final so 
you know, yeah, it's a great season to chat about. So that one, that one comes to mind as being one that stands out. I'm really looking forward, actually, without Valleys being involved as well. I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, to finishing off um, when West and Redcliffe played their grand final, uh, which I think was in '75. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to to doing that one. Um, and it won't be this season because it's 1979. But I can't wait to to do the 1979 one where uh, Valleys. Um, had a, a great year and won that grand final 26 nil with uh, Wally Lewis, uh, Ross Strudwick, and uh, Peter McQuirter at the scrum base, um, just pretty much taking all before them. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one too. What was it like being a, a Valleys fan and seeing Wally Lewis emerge? <laughs> oh, that was, uh, yeah, that was amazing. Um, he was, he just stood out so much. Um, and I think, and I'm pretty sure that Wally will tell you this himself, that playing with Ross Strudwick was one of the, the best things that could have happened to him because um, Strudwick wasn't, um, uh, didn't play pretty, shall we say. He was he was as tough as nails and he made sure that Wally was as tough as nails as well. And uh, and mm-hmm. he, he pretty much turned out that way. He, like, yeah, some of the best parts of, of Wally Lewis was his, uh, was his touch, his brilliance and his vision. But uh, some of the other parts was the tackle on Daryl Williams that uh, we all remember for Australia and, and New Zealand where, you know, that kind of stuff just needs to happen. And, uh, you know, as a Queensland supporter, you just you see it so many times, the, the try that he scored in 1989 when Queensland had, uh, you know, all those players off injured in the State of Origin game. It's He just put the state on his back and, um, and do it. I mean, one of the things that, that stands out in my memory was uh, one... I was driving home and I used to live in the inner city in Brisbane uh, just near Lang Park and I was driving home one night before a State of Origin game and saw a guy walking to um, Lang Park and he had a Queensland jersey on with a number six on the back and he had God written on the top of it <laughs> as the name. So I, I think that kind of sums up. It, you watch Wally play and you know when we did watch him play on TV pretty much every week because in those days with Valleys were playing so well they they were on the match of the match of the round whether it be the Saturday or the Sunday they pretty much got there every week so you got to see him and he was he was fantastic he really was and it seems like it was it was pretty instant once State of Origin hit that he became the the Queensland god um yeah well I I think um I'm not sure I think it might be well um uh, uh, Gordon Tallis who said it just said that you know with Wally it was a case of if you needed a kick that went downfield and you know put the opposition on the back foot he'd do it for you if you needed a tackle that had to be made he'd make it if you needed a run that had to be made and you know to to turn the tables he'd make the run if you needed a pass that uh, needed to put somebody in space he'd throw the pass to put somebody in space whatever had to be done he could do it and uh and most often he did, and that's pretty much what sums mm. him up. It's not so much that he was Bob Fulton's brilliance or, um, you know, you could rattle off all of these different guys. It's not so much that he had Chang's sidestep or he just, he, he could do so much, and uh, most often he did, and he did it when you needed it, and that was the thing that made him so good. That's the thing that, that endeared him to us as Queenslanders, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't believe how much of my childhood I spent just hating Wally Lewis. And then, you know, you, you grow up and you realize, why are you fighting against greatness like that? But, you know, I, I think State of Origin wouldn't be where it is without him and without that rivalry. So it's kind of the way it had to be. But um, just just to finish up, I, I wanted to kind of come forward and, and look at what's going on uh, in, in football today, in particular this question of the Sydney, the second Brisbane team, and um, interested to get your thoughts on what you think the best path forward is. Oh, yeah. Look, I don't know. I have a vested interest, but I'm not the only one with the the vested interest. Um, so there's a few different um, a few different places that that want to be that second team. So you've got the Ipswich Corridor, the Western Corridor, and I think that would be a really good way to go because it's not Brisbane. Um, you know, it's sort of outside Brisbane. Uh, then you've got the Easts one, and Easts are such a powerful club. But the problem is that their mascot 
is not Easts. And so you lose that link back to the BRL, back to that Brisbane um, time. So I, I don't know if I can properly go with that one either. Um, then you've got the Brisbane Bombers, and I'll come back to the Bombers. You've got Redcliffe, um, and I think that Redcliffe is probably the way to go because it brings a link to the BRL. I didn't particularly like Redcliffe when I was growing up because they weren't Valleys. They were a different club, but... Uh, you know, that's the club that I would support. That's the, the bid that I would support because that's the link to the BRL that would go into that um, that competition. So for me, that's the way I look at it. And for Easts, if they were able to take the Tiger with the, you know, black chevron, just the, the Balmain jersey, if they were able to take that into the, um, into the NRL, I'd probably go with them. Um, but they can't take that. They have to go with a different emblem, and that for me, that just loses the link to the BRL, so Redcliffe would be the team for me. But for mine, I can't see why the Brisbane Bombers aren't grabbing a hold of somebody like, and I'm, I know I'm going to sound biased here, but somebody like Valleys, where it's Fortitude Valley, it's in the city, um, or right beside the city. It's It brings that real rivalry with the Broncos, the Broncos in the city, and um, you know, Valley's in the Valley, and so you've got that real us and them kind of situation. I can't see why they wouldn't grab a hold of something that has all of that history. And if you don't want to do it with Valleys, then do it with Brothers. Like, Brothers, you've got the Brothers confraternities all the way up the coast, and I just can't understand why they want to go with something that's completely new, completely foreign, and it's got an AFL name. It just doesn't make sense to me at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I... I really struggle with that one. Um, I, uh, you know, my co-host Andrew is is always banging the Ipswich drum, um, but I, I don't really uh, know about you know Ipswich whether it's big enough, whether it could sustain a team, um, all the rest of it. Do you have an opinion on Ipswich or a you know kind of you know kind of Ipswich slash Toowoomba something like that? Yeah, no, Toowoomba's too far away. Uh, I, I don't think you'd put the two of them together. Uh, the Ipswich one is definitely viable. Uh, it, it's one of the, the biggest growing areas. It's fastest growing areas. Um, and it's definitely a viable situation. Uh, they The problem with the Ipswich one is that they've kind of gone quiet and they don't seem to be um, really pushing their own barrow much anymore. Um, Redcliffe's the one that you hear about the most. And... Uh, and, you know, the other problem with this, which is it doesn't have that really rich BRL link. It's got a sort of a BRL link, but not the rich one that goes through in the, you know, 60s and 70s uh, that Redcliffe has. Um, but, you know, Ipswich won a grand final in uh, two, in 1910. And uh, so, you know, why not? They've got a BRL link. <laughs> There's plenty of guys uh, from Ipswich. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, I was going to say, the only stipulation is Alfie's got to jump ship and run the water for Ipswich <laughs> if they get up. <laughs> yeah, and Kiwi's got to come across and coach as well. Is that the part of the plan <laughs> too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so look, Ipswich is definitely a viable goer. But um, yeah, for me, I'd, I'd be going Redcliffe because that's got the link to the BRL. And if the Bombers wanted to... Uh, do something that was sensible and um, and grab a hold of one of those foundation clubs that uh, aren't around anymore. Even West, like West aren't around, you know, in that top tier anymore. You know, go ahead and grab one of those old one old clubs that have been there forever, and um, you know, sort of take one of their brands forward. That's yeah, that's the way I'd be going. Yeah, well, interesting times. So um, yeah, we're, we're all looking forward to seeing it how it all resolves. Uh, more importantly. Uh, I'm so excited for uh, the new podcast and I'm sure all our listeners will, will jump on board as well. Uh, it's a great thing you're doing and, and can't wait to dive into BRL history. So um, yeah, BRL Moments in Time, you can download it at presumably all the the usual places. Yeah, I think so. I'm uh, I'm pretty sure it's definitely on Spotify. It's definitely on Apple Podcasts and it's on uh, quite a few others as well because I've um, had a lot of the emails to say that we've been approved in so many other places but i don't use them so i'm not really sure what they're called so but yeah, um, cool. yes but certainly the big ones as far as spotify and uh and apple it's definitely there i've uh, downloaded them from both of those myself we've got a few um pre-season episodes out at the moment which are just giving you a taste for what's to come 
Okay, awesome. So everyone jump on board that. Uh, Chris, thanks so much uh, for joining me tonight. This has been a, a, a great illuminating chat for me, so I appreciate the time. Oh, thanks very much, Michael. I really appreciate you uh, giving me the time to have the chat, and I certainly didn't expect it to go this long. So it's been terrific. I've loved chatting to you, and uh, to hear your voice at the other end of the phone instead of at the other end of the podcast, uh, just, um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of giving me goosebumps a little bit. So, yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> Oh, and it's been great, and uh, sorry to keep you. We had a little daylight saving mix up, but uh, glad we got through it all. So, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Chris. No worries. Thanks to you. feel like you need more time for all of it with a microsoft 365 family subscription you can help make the most of your time manage things you care about like your budget and family schedules keep your family's memories secured with one terabyte of OneDrive cloud storage plus have peace of mind with location alerts in the free microsoft family safety app get started at microsoft 365.com learn more